So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful, especially to Mona, who turned my arm to come here. Uh, uh, I'm very busy at the moment with uh, setting up a new institute in uh, in UK, Dementia Research Institute. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to interrupt that work and to be here today. I apologize for not being uh, uh, here yesterday, but I look forward to a very interesting day. So. Um, I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease, and here, here you have a slide which I, I got from uh, Philippe Amuyel, um, and which uh, illustrates the, the epidemic proportions of dementia. Um, you see here the race, the number of dementia patients over the next five years every time, and you see uh, the projection for 2050. Um, it's a, I think it's fair to say that it's a worldwide epidemic, and uh, we need something to be done on it. So the most important cause of uh, dementia is Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going into the details, just to remind you that the signature, the biochemical signature of Alzheimer's is the amyloid plaques and the neuronal tangles. So what's the pathological mechanism of Alzheimer's disease? Uh, is it uh, E-beta, tau? E-beta is the main component of the amyloid plaques. Tau is the main component of the tangles. Or is there something else? So, I think that the genetics are the best uh, bridge from uh, um, disease to mechanism. And here you see a, a summary, of, uh, an updated summary of uh, the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, it's a complex graph, but I, I will uh, walk you through it. So here at this side, you have a lot of genes, in fact, um, um, SNPs, which have been found to be associated with Alzheimer's disease and to increase your risk with a factor 1.1, 1.2, so low risk genes. Um, um, uh, there are very many, but I give you very low risk. The mechanism of these genes, we do not know very well. Then you have a group of genes here, which are a bit scattered, and these are the latest, uh, latest the, the newest ones. Um, genes which give you a quite increased risk, factor two, three, four, even for APOE. Uh, uh, if you are homozygous, you, you get an risk increased risk of eight, um, eight factor eight, but they are less frequent, a few percentage in the population. And then you have genes like uh, APP, amyloid precursor protein, presently in one gene, presently in two genes. If you have a mutation in those genes, your risk for Alzheimer's disease is 100%, so full penetrant. And so you see, we, get, we start to get a landscape of genes. And there starts also to emerge a picture from these genes. And so, of course, amyloid, amyloid pathology is one of it. But then the other is phospholipids. And the phospholipids, lipids come from the APOE connection, of course, apolipoprotein A. But also, for instance, ABCA7, which is an, a phospholipid transporter um, of, or uh, clustering, APOG, apolipoprotein binding G. Uh, but also this recent gene, uh, phospholipase C gamma 2, is involved in the phospholipid pathways. And then a third uh, common theme is microglia function, and that's really uh, kind of exciting uh, because many of these genes trace, trace back to microglia. Here you have complement receptor 1, CDT, CD33. Uh, you have here TREM2, which is a quite, uh, it's exclusively expressed in uh, microglia. These new genes are also phospholipase, uh, phospholipase C gamma 2, and ABE3 are also expressed in microglia. And as I will show you at the end of my talk, uh, apolipoprotein E becomes highly overexpressed in microglia during uh, Alzheimer's disease. So, I mean, these three <coughs> themes are emerging and are also probably linked to each other. Of course, the question is how they are and uh, when and how they link. So the amyloid hypothesis or the amyloidogenic pathway has been very well studied. Um, here you see the amyloid peptide, uh, the, the amyloid peptide, which is a part of the amyloid precursor protein. There are about 20 mutations in this gene which cause Alzheimer's disease. Here you see the presence subunit, which is part of the gamma secretase. And the gamma secretase is one of the proteases cleaving a beta. Uh, the other enzyme is beta secretase. And so this, uh, so there have been trials, uh, quite some drug trials now, testing the amyloid hypothesis. So there have been antibodies made against the A-beta peptide and injected, but these trials have all failed. There is still one, one, uh, a couple running. 
Um, then the beta secretase, this has been one of the most hopeful targets because the side effects uh, uh, blocking this enzyme are limited. Uh, there has just been one phase three trial stopped because of lack of efficacy, but it's in a late stage of the disorder and there are still some trials running. And then the last uh, target in this pathway is the gamma secretase. Um, and there also a couple of years ago, uh, in fact, the pharmaceutical industry has given up on gamma secretase largely uh, because of side effects. So you see the, the picture is quite bleak at the moment. Um, there is still hope for these drugs because we have learned that we treat the patients too late when the brain is, is gone basically, so you do not expect to, to have much effect of it. So I expect that in the future it might be that we use this um, beta therapy. A second remark I would like to make is that uh, this is antibodies and I really, we can discuss that maybe at the end, I do not know really what's the best way to target with an antibody a beta peptide. We don't know what the toxic conformation is. So basically it's not enough in my opinion to bind an antibody to something to, to get a, um, a cure. The beta secretase, there is no genetic link to beta secretase. So, I mean, although the industry claims that this is the best validated drug target, I'm not so sure. The best validated drug target is this gamma secretase, which has 150 mutations causing Alzheimer's disease. And the mechanism of these mutations is different than simply over, uh, overproducing a beta. I will explain you that in a minute. So I think that, well, the question has to be raised, have we been to a beta-centric? And I tried to explain you already that I don't think that we have to be a beta to uh, a beta-centric. I think we have just been too simple in our thinking about a beta. And so I will first give you some new insights from our lab on the gamma secretase, which uh, will enlighten you a little bit more in our thinking on amyloid beta. So again, I told you already that uh, mutations in the Priscillin gene are uh, important. They are a direct cause of Alzheimer's disease, 100% penetrance. And so if you, here you see the, the, the gamma secretase. So the Priscillin is a subunit of this gamma secretase enzyme, which is sitting in a membrane. Um, and the mutations are all in the Priscillin subunit, and they are all missense mutations. So there has never been a mutation which inactivates uh, gamma secretase. So it's never a clear loss of function. Um, um, and so what we also know is that all these mutations consistently uh, shift a beta profile. So um, I will explain you that um, in a minute. So they change the type of a betas generated. Not they ch don't change the quantity of the betas, but they increase the amyloid. Uh, the, they change the quality of the amyloid peptide. And so the question is, how does these mutations do that? Uh, after 20 years, we still don't know how these mutations cause these changes in a beta profiles. And that's the work that uh, Lucia, Lucia chavez Gutierrez in my group has worked on for a couple of years. So here you see the gamma secretase again, and here you see how we think that it works. So here you have a substrate, amyloid precursor protein, for instance, but also notch and a couple of other, imp other important substrates are processed by this enzyme. And so um, when it is hit by this enzyme, you get a first cleavage here close to the cytoplasmic site releasing the intracellular domain of this substrate. So for notch, this gives you notch signaling. There are a couple of other uh, substrates. For APP, we do not know what this intracellular domain does, uh, uh, so I'm going to skip that. But then the next step, this is the signaling function of gamma secretase. But then the next processing steps are, are kind of complicated. They are consecutive cleavages. And what happens basically is that you get shorter and shorter transmembrane domains. And at a certain moment, this transmembrane domain is too short and the peptide, which is remaining, is released into the extracellular medium. And so in the case of amyloid precursor protein, these are different a beta peptides. And here's a complicated scheme, or in fact a simplified scheme, um, which explains how we enzyma en uh, enzymatically think it works. So you get uh, a first enzyme subset complex, which is between this long transmembrane domain, C99, we call it in case of APP, and, uh, and the enzyme. Then you get the first cleavage, and you get a new enzyme subset complex which contains a beta-49 and the enzyme, and so on, and so on. And so you get, in fact, a series of different enzyme subset complexes, and I think that's the bottom line to understand how this enzyme works. So now is the question, how can you study these different steps? And uh, Lucia came up with the idea to use heat in destabilization, so progressive heat destabilization of the purified uh, protein. 
And here you see a very simple uh, assay. So this is the intracellular domain. So this is this first cleavage which we measure here. And you see that with increasing heat, you get first an activation and then a desactivation of the enzyme. So if you use now the same type of heating to measure the, the, the gamma cleavages, so these, these consecutive, these next cleavages which clean the transmembrane domain, you see the following. Here you see a couple of peptides, so, so the, the release of these peptides is a bit randomly, it's stochastic. And so at 37 degrees, you see that you produce mainly a beta 40 and a beta 38, so short peptides, so you release only peptides at the last steps of this uh, process. But if you heat it to 45, you see here this change, this dramatic change in profiles of the beta peptides. And actually, this profile is very similar to the profile you would get with the clinical mutation of gamma secretase. So heat denaturation or destabilization, I would say, mimics the, f the, 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 the way that clinical mutations affect the processivity of this enzyme. And so, um, so you can actually measure. This is a, simplify, a simple assay. It's an uremic gel where you see the peptides. Here we did ELISA assays. And you see the, the, the heat sensitiv sensitivity of the different reactions. So here we measure um, a beta 43. And, and here we measure um, uh, a beta 38. So, so a beta 38 is the last step. A beta 43 is this step. And you see that the heat sen sensitivity of this step is much higher than the heat sensitivity of this step. So we can really discriminate between the different um, enzyme substrate complexes. And so I'm making a, a long story uh, very short. So we did this also with, with different mutations, with different age of onsets. And again, what you see here is these temperature shifts. Here you see the wild type situation, and you see that every color is another uh, clinical mutation. You see that every mutation shifts this uh, sensitivity to temperature in a different way. And so here you see, for instance, that a beta-45 substrate, so, so one of the shorter peptides, is released much faster at much lower temperature with the clinical mutations than with the wild-type situation. So basically explaining you that, that, that these uh, mutant-containing enzymes keep the substrate in a much less efficient way. And so that explains you why you get longer a beta peptides from um, from um, gamma secretase. Um, we, we have a lot of more experiments to, to demonstrate that, but basically, in essence, what I showed to you is that these clinical mutations in Presilin destabilize the gamma, the enzyme substrate complexes, which causes then a fast release of these long beta peptides. We have also evidence that the mutations in the substrate, in amyloid precursor protein, affect this enzyme substrate complex in the same way. And then changes in the membrane environment changes in lipid, and I alluded already at this lipid metabolism in the, the genetic uh, data, affect this enzyme substrate uh, complex stability. And finally, as I showed you, changes in temperature, and there is a form of Mediterranean fever, um, which genetic Mediterranean fever, which is associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So basically, I think that we have here, I'm not saying that is explaining all Alzheimer's disease, but we have here a lot of factors which are involved in Alzheimer's disease which converse, converge on a similar uh, biochemical mechanism. And the last slide I would like to show you, and, and which all uh, result in the release of longer a beta peptides. And for the, the, the specialist, I didn't say a beta 42. I said longer a beta peptides. I mentioned a beta 45. Um, we are not able to measure a beta 48 and 49 at this moment, but I think that the present limitations tell us that it's these longer a beta peptides which cause disease. So, so this stabilization of uh, presenlin is at the core of the pathogenic mechanism. And just the last illustration to, to prove that this is really important for Alzheimer's disease, and it's data which I didn't believe in the beginning when Lucia produced them, uh, but facts are facts. So what you see here is the age of onset of different uh, presenlin mutants. And you see here, uh, this is early onset, and this is well, relative late onset, 45, uh, uh, for between 45 and 50. And what you see here is the temp thermostability of the complex um, um, measured as the release of the, intracellular, uh, of, of the intracellular domain. And you see that the most, the earliest, the, the, the mutations which cause the most early onset of Alzheimer's disease are also the most thermo-instable. 
And so there is a perfect correlation between this, this enzym enzymatic property and the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So I think we are really looking at the heart of the disease. So then the next question is, of course, if a beta is causally linked to Alzheimer's disease, why do the models not mimic the disorder, uh, the, the, the mouse models? And why does therapy against amyloid not affect uh, 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 the patients? And I think the answer is very clear. Um, that's because we are still thinking in terms of amyloid hypothesis. Um, and the amyloid hypothesis, as you see here, is 25 years old and is a linear hypothesis, a beta, and then you have neurons dying, and then you have the brain dying, and you have dementia. So I think the criticism is here. This is much too linear thinking. Um, uh, it's not because you have a beta that you get immediately Alzheimer's disease. The brain does something against it. It's a trigger, but it's a long process which follows. So it's also not quantitative. The amyloid hypothesis says more a beta, more Alzheimer's. I told you it's longer a beta, more Alzheimer's. It's a qualitative uh, um, hypothesis. Neurocentric, um, Alzheimer's disease is a mix. I mentioned already microglia. There are many other cell types involved. And then finally, it's not a beta 42, as I explained to you. It's a mix of different uh, biochemical, different a betas, different tau's. And finally, the time factor is not taken into account. So we need more integrated ways to understand the disorder. And that's what I called the cellular phase of Alzheimer's disease. And the second point I would like to make is that we need better models, uh, humanized models, uh, probably. And I'm going to talk first a little bit about this and then about this. So this is what I would call the mouse model paradox. So we have been very successful in generating uh, mouse models. We generate a lot of this amyloid. Uh, and every dot here is an amyloid plaque in a mouse. And this mouse, it's only when you wait, when the brain is really overloaded with uh, amyloid that you start to see some neurodegeneration, but cell death has been extremely difficult to mimic, and tangles have never been seen, tau has never been seen. The behavior changes in these mice, there is a big discussion whether this behavior is, is some artifact caused by the huge overexpression of, of APP and A beta, or whether it's really relevant for Alzheimer's disease. So we are really a bit blocked with the mouse models. And so most, most um, researchers think it's time. It's because uh, these mice are only one and a half year old uh, that you cannot mimic a disease which takes 20, 30 years um, to evolve in, uh, in patients. But I think that there is also the possibility that it's a human genetic background. There are differences in the genes um, uh, used by humans and by mouse. And so we were thinking, can we maybe mimic the disease a bit better um, in, in, in human-derived cells? And of course, then everybody thinks about iPS cells. Um, uh, but the problem with iPS cells is that it's again a cell line. It's, an, uh, it's a cell line in a plastic dish. Uh, the problem is to differentiate them. It takes you eight months before, before you get real neurons. Uh, don't get an infection, please. And you still miss all the other, other um, uh, um, uh, cells. To, to get a disease model. And on top of it, um, most of the studies done with IPS cells use un undifferentiated, or, well, slight, um, light versions of differentiations of, of cells. So you get, uh, uh, for instance, tau um, uh, in adult uh, neurons in humans, you get a normal 3R to 4R, repeat tau, one to one. This is lacking in most of the IPS cells used. So, so I don't think that, that we will get there. So we thought, let's differentiate them to the stage of neuronal progenitor and transplant them in a mouse model. So we have the amyloid from the mouse, from the model, and we have the human <coughs> genetic background from the iPS cells. And so um, that's what we did. And here you see such transplants, uh, the GFP uh, marks, so we can see these cells uh, in, the, in the mouse brain. Here you see, for instance, the synapse between a human uh, to, uh, be between a human and a mouse a neuron. You see here gold label, which indicates that it's um, uh, a human uh, neuron. And then um, we also characterize these grafts uh, by deep sequencing. So you can cut out this graft back from the mouse and then do all kinds of analysis. Um, and here you see 18 transplants, which we compared for markers for telencephalic uh, differentiation, neural maturation, glutamate, GABA, ergic, etc. And you see that, that these graphs are remarkable, reproducible, so, uh, uh, so that's good news. So then we expose this graph to amyloid plaque, so it's amyloid coming from the, from the it's hu human A beta, from the overexpressed APP in the mouse, but it comes into the graphs, as you can see here, and as you can see here. 
And so the amulet burden in the host and the graft are, are similar, so that's good news. Uh, also, the quality of the plaques is similar in the transplant to, to, to what you see in the host. And here you see, for instance, already a very important uh, element. So we, we characterized the, the, the changes in tau. So tau is the other component of, of Alzheimer's disease, which causes the tangles and these are lacking in the mouse models. And one of the reasons is that mouse models only make four repeaters. So they make only these versions of tau, while in adult human neurons, you have two, you have four repeat tau um, um, and three repeat tau. And as you can see here in the young transplants, we have an abundance of, um, uh, of uh, three repeat tau, but in the older transplants, we get a one-to-one -one ratio, which is equally to what you see in humans. And here you see the histo histology. So um, four repeat tau is strong in the mouse, uh, so that's the mouse background. But here at, at uh, two, four months, you almost don't see any four uh, repeat staining. But then at six months, you start to see four repeat staining. And at eight months, you see clearly strong four repeat staining. So, so proving what I said, that this tau is mature. So there is astrogliosis and microgliosis in the grafts. Here you see stainings for IBA1 and stainings for GFAP. And you see here clearly that these um, grafts are exposed. Uh, so this is a microglia. Uh, in this transplant, so it's uh, really uh, preserved. Uh, and here you see then typical lesions for Alzheimer's disease. Here you see neuritic pathology. Um, here you see presynaptic pathology is typical for Alzheimer's disease patients where you have this swelling of uh, presynaptic uh, uh, compartments. This is staining with synaptophysin. Um, and then you have also dendritic retraction. Here you see a MAP2 staining, and you see here clearly a retraction of the dendrites around this amyloid plaque. So we get really fantastic um, uh, pictures similar to what you see in uh, human patients. But this is really the most important feature, which is lacking from all the mouse models, and that's massive neuronal death. And here you see a top row staining, so which stains the, the human nuclei in the transplant in a mouse where there is no amyloid, so no T of Lavin staining. And here you see an area in a mouse where there is a lot of amyloid uh, plaque staining, and you see here this hole in this transplant. We can't, can't quantify that. So after two months, there is no difference between the transplants in the, we transplant the, the, the IPS cells at P0, just when the pups are born. And so after two months, we don't see a difference in the amount of neurons in the transplant and in the wild, in the amyloid mouse and in the wild type mouse. But after six months, we see really a dramatic decrease um, uh, in the number of neurons. And so when we look in the, in the electron micro microscope, um, and also when we do apoptotic marker stainings, the cell that is necrosis-like, as you can see here, uh, it's not apoptosis. We are not, here you see quantification, it's really uh, very strong and dramatic. We, we are not sure what type of necrosis is happening. So the, the deep sequencing we did uh, gives us a lot of changes, and we are still trying to, to understand what the mechanism is behind this. So, but as you see, see, I was skating around the issue of tau and tangles. Uh, as I said, that's lacking in the, in, the, in the mouse models. And so here you see uh, abnormal phosphorylation of tau. Very clear, very nice. But that has also been seen in mouse, so that's not really new. Uh, but when we did the staining with MC1, which is an epitope, which is a conformational epitope, which shows that tau has an abnormal conformation, is underway to form tangles, then we get indeed also quite some nice staining in our transplants, which is MC1 staining is never positive in the mouse models. So it shows you that something is happening with tau in these neurons, but we don't get any tangles. We have done really a lot of work because we hope to see tangles in this model. So we get here a very interesting conclusion. Uh, we get cell death, which was lacking in the mouse models. We get changes in tau, but we get cell death without tangle formation. So the question is whether the tangle formation is really necessary to get uh, um, cell loss in, in, in Alzheimer's disease. So then uh, we went on and we tried to, to understand a little bit mechanism, and that's just early, early stage. So uh, again, we take out the graft. And now you have to see, we can take grafts at every stage of the disease. So you cannot do that with human, human brain, of course. There you are limited to the end stage. Here we can really take neurons for the when they are just exposed to amyloid, and then we can follow the course of the disease. And so that's what we are doing at the moment. We are characterizing every step. And here you see already results where we compared very early 
two to three months with uh, very late eight months and you see changes in genes uh, controlling cell death as I said to you and then uh, synapse, synaptic transmission etc uh, etc et and so of course these are classical descriptive uh, analyses but then you go into those categories and you try to I, I hope I'm okay with my time Yeah, you started three minutes late. Three minutes. I will end. I will end perfectly in time. <laughs> so. Um, Some questions. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so I will speed up. So um, one of the, the the interesting thing is, as I said, there is a difference between human and mouse. And so what we found here, for instance, is two uh, non-coding RNAs which are strongly upregulated in the late phase of this disease. Um, uh, and then we have. Uh, for instance, here, CLAC collagen 25A, the non-amyloid component of uh, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, of amyloid plaques, which is uh, a, uh, a protein studied already for many years in the Alzheimer field, uh, which is downregulated. And very interesting, uh, 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 eight months ago, there was a paper in Cell about genes which protect again, or, or which make you healthy aging. And there were eight polymorphisms in the CLAC gene, which uh, were associated with long, with healthy long longevity. So, I mean, we are working on that, but I think it's a very promising model. So, conclusion, this model uses genotypically normal uh, neurons, so we don't manipulate these neurons, so I think that's also very relevant if you want to study the mechanism. They express normal TR for R tau ratios. They develop abnormal tau phosphorylation, but no tangles. So, they have necrosis. Um, and then the question is, does this confirm the amyloid hypothesis? Well, in a certain way, if you are really um, strong amyloid hypothesis uh, lover, you will say yes, because a beta drives the pathology. I would say yes to a certain extent. I, I think a beta is essential for Alzheimer's, but uh, uh, it doesn't explain the microglia involvement. It doesn't explain the tau involvement. It doesn't explain the time uh, uh, features. So I, I think that this model mainly tells us that we are now underway to approach Alzheimer's disease in a more, much more integrated way. And so that's, uh, uh, and I will spend three minutes on that. We need more integrated ways to understand this disorder. And so also these curves, which some of you might have seen, which are the JAX curves shown too many times. These are pure correlative curves showing that first amyloid is increasing, then tau, then you get dementia and, and so on. I mean, this is purely descriptive, but it, in, it implies causal relationships um, so if you take away this curve, then this other curve sh shouldn't appear. But there's absolutely no evidence for that. And I think that we should think much more complicated. So you get first this biochemical phase where amyloid and tau are accumulating. But then you get a cellular phase. So this brain is not taking that for granted. They st the brain starts to react. And so we know, basically, that patients with amyloid and tau in their brain can be react normally for 10, 15, 20 years before they get dementia. And that's the cellular phase. phase. There are microglia involved, synaptic changes, uh, astroglia changes, and so on. And so this keeps the homeostasis of the brain for, for many, many years. And that's the real interesting part of Alzheimer's disease. That's what we need to investigate. So how are you going to do that? Um, well, what you basically have is you have a homeostatic state, and then you have a phase of stress response where the network is not really changing between different cells, but where the cells themselves have different responses. And then finally you get the impairment phase where this network falls apart. So you can study that in different ways and, and I'm going to, to go fast through this. This is the knock-in mouse from Saido which shows a lot of inflammatory changes at late stages um, and you get a huge increase in microglia invasion. And so what we did is we did single cell uh, analysis of the genetic expression of the transcripts in this microglia, very, very brief. Here you see the analyze of every, every dot is a microglia. And the orange one are young mice, and the blue ones are the old mice, 22 months old. And then the light blue are the transgenic mice, the Alzheimer mouse, and the light orange are the transgenic young mice. You see not much of a difference in the young stage, but you see here a very interesting population which separates completely from the aged microglia. And well, there are many genes, many genes of interest in the microglia, but this is when we just only look to APOE. So you get a huge overexpression of APOE in this microglia uh, aged. And so I will skip all the rest. We do uh, transcriptomics 
uh, a, um, uh, a spatial transcriptomics to uh, relay, correlate these changes because these are single cells. They are all scattered over, uh, uh, they are in solution. So you want also to know where it is. And so we use these glass cover slips, which allow you to transfer mRNA, sorry, transfer mRNA to the glass cover slip and to sequence and to find out where the mRNA is changed. But I have no time to talk about that. Here is, well, good. So conclusion, last slide. A beta is not out, but its role needs rethinking. Uh, we need better humanized animal models to make progress over the next dec decade, and we need unbiased approaches to understand uh, what is going on in the cellular phase of ED. And so these are the acknowledgments, uh, which I have no time to do. Yeah.